Good evening, everyone. Welcome to another <laughs> thrilling Pretty Gritty Tours adventure. Tonight is unequivocally one of the heaviest lifts I've done to date. And we find ourselves here at a juncture between the past, the present, and the future. And it is my distinguished privilege and honor to welcome you all tonight to what is now the 12th almost annual Living History Cemetery Tour. Now, for those of you who are acquainted with this tradition, it is something that has occurred in Tacoma for, as you may have guessed it, 12-ish years now, and has become one of the most beloved traditions in Tacoma, I would recommend, and I'm pretty confident in that, so I'm saying it. Things got a little different, as you may have recognized, with the pandemic. And so when at a Heritage League meeting, one of my favorite uh, living history reenactors, Karen Haas, was like, I don't know if it's going to happen this year. I swooped in right away and I was like, listen, no pressure. But if you guys want to do your cemetery tour as a virtual event, I will come out and film it and we'll curate it and it will be awesome. And I stand by that decision. It's one of the things I'm proudest of having been a part of, and I'm very excited for all of you to get to experience it tonight. We are going to dive in to the Tacoma Cemetery, and you are going to get to meet six of the most prominent and influential people of Tacoma's history. Tonight's theme is, of course, Pillars of Tacoma. And I think it's a very appropriate title and that each of the people that you're gonna to speak to tonight from beyond the grave are, are really, truly influential to the story of Tacoma in a variety of ways. Um, I'm going to actually turn it over for a moment to one of my new friends, uh, local historian and all around fantastic person, uh, Melissa McGinnis. She used to be, I believe, the historic an artifacts curation coordinator for Metro Parks Tacoma. And she's going to welcome you guys in really quick. So, Melissa. And welcome to the 12th almost annual Living History Cemetery Tour. We have to throw the word almost in now because we were not able to offer this tour in 2020 due to the COVID-19 pandemic. But for those of you not familiar with the tour, um, essentially it was started back in 2009. So when a group of living history reenactors and uh, local history enthusiasts got together, we'd participated in a similar tour up in Port Townsend, Washington, and decided we needed one here in Tacoma too. And what better place than the beautiful historic Tacoma Cemetery? After all, so many of Tacoma's early residents are buried here. Now, normally the tour is held live here in the cemetery and groups go from gravesite to gravesite and hear the life story of the different individuals buried there. But this year we decided to try something a little different and offer a virtual tour just to ensure the health and safety of everyone involved. But before we begin with the actual tour, I would like to take just a couple minutes and give you a little background history of early Tacoma, essentially just to set the scene for the stories that you're about to hear. And our story is going to start in 1864. Now that's the year that President Abraham Lincoln signed the charter with the Northern Pacific Railroad Company to establish the second transcontinental railroad. Now this one was going to run from the shores of Lake Superior to the port waters of Puget Sound. But where on Puget Sound? Where was the western terminus of the railroad going to be? That was the question. No one knew where it was going to land, but they did know wherever that terminus was located, a great city was soon to follow. And I have to think that's what Job Carr was thinking about back in 1864 when he paddled his canoe into Commencement Bay and had his eureka moment, looking around at this beautiful, secluded, deep water harbor and all these natural resources, thinking, this is it. This is where the terminus of the railroad is going to be. So Job uh, took a land claim, started to build a house, uh, essentially in the area we refer to as Old Town Tacoma today. Well, um, it wasn't too long for more people started to think, Job may be right, this could be the location. And other settlers came into the area, including a man by the name of Morton McCarver. Now, Mr. McCarver was a real um, mover and shaker, and he was convinced that this was going to be it. This was the terminus. And you know what? The terminus needed a great name for their city. And at first he thought it should be called Commencement City. After all, it was going to be located on the shores of Commencement Bay. 
But the more he thought about it, he said, no, we should name it after the mountain. Let's call it Tacoma, or often referred to as Mount Rainier, Rainier today. Well, McCarver went down to the county to register the name of his city as Tacoma, only to discover that Anthony Carr, Joe Carr's son, had already gone down and registered the Carr property under the name Tacoma. So Mar Morton McCarver made a slight little change and decided it should be called Tacoma City. Unfortunately for Carr, McCarver, and all those other early residents of Tacoma City, when the railroad finally made their announcement in 1873, Tacoma City was not to be the terminus of the railroad. Instead, the railroad chose to go several miles more down the shoreline and establish their own city, which they named, by the way, New Tacoma. Yes, for several years we had New Tacoma and Tacoma City sitting literally side by side. It wasn't until 1884 that the two communities came together, formed a single government, and simplified the name to Tacoma as we know it today. But in the meantime, the railroad builders and the city planners had all been very busy. Matter of fact, the first train got to Tacoma on December 16, 1873. Now, it wasn't a real long train line. The track had only been laid to uh, Kalama, Washington at that point in time, but it was a start. It was going to be about another 15 years before the actual transcontinental railroad was complete. But people saw the opportunity. They knew this was going to be a great city, so they started moving in. By 1880, we had about 1,100 people living in Tacoma City in New Tacoma. Now, that may not seem like much, but there'd only been 47 people living here back in 1873, so things were definitely on the move. And the railroad kept building over the next decade, laying track across the Midwest, and people continued to move in. But the final hurdle for the railroad was to get across the Cascade Mountains. And what they chose to do was to build a tunnel at an area called Stampede Pass. Well, it was May of 1888 and the tunnel was finally complete. Tacoma, Pierce County, Puget Sound were all connected by rail to the rest of the uh, country and the economy was absolutely going to boom. This is the op moment that people have been waiting for. They had been pouring into Tacoma from around the country, from around the world. They were building homes, starting businesses, all seeking their opportunity to make their fortune in the world. A matter of fact, by 1890, we had about 36,000 people living here, up from just 1,100 10 years earlier. And uh, this was the same time period that the author Rudyard Kipling visited the area, and he described Tacoma in the 1880s as a town smitten by a boom of the boomiest and that it was. The early city planners worked so hard they wanted Tacoma to be all that it could be. They were building exquisite hotels, expansive parks, stately homes, every business, service, amenity you would possibly imagine you'd find in an older, more established community. Things were going great for Tacoma. The economy was on a great trajectory and then a little thing called the crash or panic of 1893 came along. Now this was a nationwide depression. It was terrible. Um, the whole country was impacted, but it was basically uh, around the railroad industry. So railroad towns like Tacoma were especially hard hit. As a matter of fact, Tacoma's premier historian, Murray Morgan, he described Tacoma as the hardest hit city in the country. Banks failed, land values collapsed, people left, businesses closed. It was a terrible time for Tacoma. But there is one good thing about depressions, they don't last forever. There's gonna be something else to come along soon to get that economy going again. And one of the things that got the North Pacific Northwest going was the discovery of gold actually up in the Klondike. The people started coming back to the Pacific Northwest as a jumping off point to go to the Klondike to seek their fortune. And admittedly, Seattle made out a little better during the gold rush than Tacoma, but nonetheless, people started coming back, the economy started to grow again, the jobs came back. A whole new generation of leaders and movers and shakers had come in to make their mark upon the city. After that, there have been times of boom, there's been times of bust, but through it all, Tacoma has endured. And I have to think those early residents of Tacoma would be thrilled to know that Tacoma is now experiencing a brand new boom of the boomiest. Before we begin the tour, though, I want to thank a couple of people. First of all, the Tacoma Cemetery for graciously hosting this tour every year. To the living history reenactors who research, write, and present the life story of these early Tacoma residents. To Pretty Gritty Tours for making our virtual tour possible this year. And to those of you who have attended the tours over the years and supported us. We greatly appreciate you. And we look forward to seeing you live at the tour at the cemetery again next year. But on with the tour. Oh man, 
it's such a surreal experience to have Melissa on board with this project because it's it's she's doing my job right now. And so I'm like, I don't even know what to, to tell everyone about the history of this moment. So I won't. I will now allow you to experience Tacoma through the voices of those who have gone before us. It is my privilege and honor to introduce you to our first guest tonight, uh, Mr. Herbert Hunt. I don't recognize you. You must be the new reporter. Welcome. I'm sorry we haven't had a chance to meet yet. I hope you're very excited to be at the Tacoma Daily News, the finest newspaper in Tacoma. I have high hopes for 1918, and I'm sure you're going to make it a great year. I hope to see some of it, perhaps all of it. Um, you probably wondered if you even had an editor, since I'm not here much. So uh, let me uh, immediately tell you, you do have an editor. Uh, and in fact, I looked at one of your stories this morning, and I've returned it to your desk. You'll find 13 corrections circled. Please, uh, you are given a list of 100 words and phrases that we do not use at the Tacoma Daily News because they are cliched. We practice elegance of diction and careful word selection. So please correct your copy. The second matter is that I can see you push off from your desk with gusto, and I admire energy in a newspaper man, but your desk has shifted. It is now 12 inches from the wall. Your desk is to be 18 inches from the wall. That is so the janitor can sweep properly and there's a clearance for him to clean. You know, when the telephone came along, a marvelous invention, I was the one who said the wires must hang from the ceiling. Because why would you have wires on the floor? All the other newsrooms have wires on the floor. It's very untidy. I want my newsroom to be as tidy as my rose garden at home. Because a tidy desk promotes tidy thought. And we are tidy in our words and in our news. Please remember that. Be assured, your editors are called to the same standards of excellence. Every morning from my sickbed, I send them a copy of the paper, blue pencil, with corrections so that they may be further instructed. You don't want to have your desk become messy and cluttered with the debris of history. Uh, it's my job to go through that, I suppose. So you are to clean your desk every three months. The scraps of history you can send over to me. I, I should probably talk about that because I'm sure some of the men are saying, well, why is the old man not at the newsroom? If he's dying, doesn't he want to spend his last days here? But it's very important to me to spend my time studying history because it's all I can really do. Um, I've had seven operations for my cancer and uh, it's not looking well, but I am well enough to work on my histories and it's very important I do that because it's my histories that will provide a source of income for my family. We already did quite well with my first series of books, three volumes, Tacoma, its history and its builders. That will be the first place anyone goes to when they want to know about the history of Tacoma. Any future historians will have to refer to that book because I tracked down the sources myself. I found the men who had been involved in the 1885 expulsion of the Chinese and I spoke with them. I spoke to uh, General Kautz who built the buildings at Fort Stillicum. He told me he thought the white man will someday regret hanging Leshi, and I think that's probably true. What Tacoma needed was someone to tell stories, not write a boring history. And that's why my book is full of what I think are very interesting stories and I hope the future will think that as well. I hope to provide this income for my wife because we have four children. Uh, I, I'm very proud of Lucille. Uh, we met when uh, at the university in Indiana. You probably recognize the colors of DePaul University. Um, I was originally a newspaper man in the Midwest. I was very happy in Baltimore, but I was recruited to edit a newspaper in Everett. Don't go to Everett, no future. But for 12 years, I have been in Tacoma and I have been absolutely delighted to work at the Daily News. I was very popular as an after dinner speaker talking about current events. Uh, it is said that there's no one who knows more about the Civil War than me. I don't know if that's true or not, but I do hope to live long enough to write a children's book for children so they can learn more about the Civil War. I believe passionately that history is important, and I do hope that the family obtains some income from my volumes. We're currently working on a second series of books, Washington, West of the Cascades, which I, I hope will provide them some income. 
I have been, however, very dedicated to keeping the newspaper at a high level of, of excellence. I had a friend write to me the other day, he knows of my illness, and he says, Mr. Hunt, I will always remember you as a newspaper man. And secondly, I will remember you as an exceedingly busy newspaper man. I was very complimented and honored when President Susilo of the University of Washington offered me the opportunity to chair the journalism department at the University of Washington. He offered that to me twice, and it was an honor. But I'm not an educator. I'm a newspaper man. I'll live a newspaper man, and I will die a newspaper man. But I'm also happy to have told the stories of my history. And I hope you'll think about that, because you look well, you look healthy. Now it's your turn to tell the stories of history. Remember, you are the guardians of the memories of we who have gone before. Just be tidy about it. Thank you, Mr. Hunt, for your insightful works and all of the history that you've done for the city of Tacoma from, from the start until now. Let's keep this journey rolling, shall we? Now, this is a rare treat because normally when the Living History Cemetery Tour is done in person, you can't go all the way across the Tacoma Cemetery to certain grave sites uh, because it's a massive, sprawling place. But tonight we actually get to meet Ms. Taya Foss actually at the site where she is buried. It is my pleasure to introduce you now to Ms. Taya Foss. I have always believed that we are all part of one great body and we must consider that we were born for the good of the whole. And today you are hearing that belief lived out in the stories from Tacoma's past. Now my story begins on a farm near Eidsberg, Norway. Oh, it was a beautiful place, but times they were hard. I was fortunate to be able to go to school until I was 14 years of age, but then I had to go to the city of Christiania to get a job. But fortunately for me, my older sister Julia lived there, and it was at her home that I met her husband's brother, Andrew. Oh, it wasn't long till we all knew that there was going to be another marriage between our families. Now, Andrew was a sailor, a skilled ship's carpenter, and we both agreed that the life of a sailor did not blend well with the life of a family. And so, because jobs were so scarce in Norway, we determined to immigrate to the land of opportunity. We settled first in St. Paul, Minnesota, because there was a large Norwegian community there. But, oh, the opportunities were limited and the weather, it was so cold in the winter and so hot and humid in the summer. But then we started hearing about a place called Puget's Sound, where they all said there were plenty of good jobs and a much milder climate. Well, we thought this sounded like the perfect place for us. Andrew arrived here in the fall of 1888. He worked his way west as a carpenter for the Northern Pacific Railroad. I followed that spring with the children. My trip was only seven days on the railroad, but oh, it seemed like so much longer in that crowded train car with two active little boys and newborn baby Lillian in my arms. And so we came to Tacoma, where rail meets sail. And Andrew so proudly showed to us the floating house that he built for us out of lumber that he salvaged from Commencement Bay. And so I, I hid my lifelong fear of the water, and we started our new life. Andrew, he worked so hard at Tacoma tugboats, but it was a struggle to make ends meet. And so when he had the opportunity to earn more, helping to build a house across over to Henderson Bay, well, he jumped at the chance, even though he knew he would be gone for some eight weeks. And so he rolled away and I stayed in the floating house with the children. Well, several weeks later, another man came rowing by, complaining about City of Destiny. Well, some disappointment it was for him. If he could find someone to give him $10 for this broken down old rowboat, he would be gone so fast. Well, knowing how little money we had in the family jug, I asked him, Sir, would you consider taking five? Well, he thought, and then he agreed. Well, it only took one look to realize the boat was not broken down. It only needed a good cleaning. 
being a good Norwegian housewife? I knew a thing or two about cleaning. So I cleaned it, I painted it with some green and white paint we had about the house, and I sold it. And with the profits, I bought two more. And I cleaned them, and I painted them, and I sold them, and I bought more. Well, I just kept on doing that. And after a while, I kept four back that I started renting out to people. And so when Andrew came back, he proudly showed us the $32 that he'd earned, which was good money in those days. But he took one look at the $41 that I'd earned, and he said, now I shall stay home and build rowboats for my woman. And thus, the Foss Boathouse was born. Now, they call Tacoma the city of destiny, and I'm thinking that Tacoma and boats, they were our destiny. Starting with the rowboats for recreation, we expanded into the launches to service the ships in the harbor. And some of them, we put the tow bits on to bring the logs from the logging camps to the lumber mills. And then we started building the stronger boats with the bigger engines, and we entered the age of towing. Now, ours was originally a family business. It was Andrew and me and our children. And then as we grew, we included our siblings and their children. Then we grew more and we started including others, mostly Scandinavian immigrants. And not only did we pay them, we gave them a place to live and food to eat. And we helped them become United States citizens. And they started calling us Mother Foss and Father Foss. Oh, and the last boathouse that I was at, that was our large one there at the mouth of the Tacoma Waterway, right next to Mayor Fawcett's municipal dock. Now, our family has always been active in the community, and I discovered that a cup of coffee and perhaps a piece of my tasty Norwegian pastries, they would encourage people to stop, sit down, and talk. And this is the way that I got to know the many different kinds of people we lived with and worked with here. Now, watching my beloved daughter Lillian waste away and then die of tuberculosis at the young age of 25, well, I was never the same after that, but her spirit lived on. For you see, her last wish that was to donate her body to science in the hope that others would not suffer from this terrible disease. The years went on. Our three boys, they took over more of the day-to-day -day runnings of the boathouse. I thought I had so many things to do yet, but the good Lord, he had other ideas and he took me home the day before my 70th birthday. And you know, they say that my funeral was the largest Tacoma had ever seen. Such a fuss for a simple woman. Although I am proud that we founded a prosperous company that was always mindful of the needs of others. And I want to remind you all, life is not for oneself. It is for helping each other. And as you do so, never forget that you are all the guardians of the memories of we who have gone before. I absolutely adore that story, and I think it was masterfully told. And as another Norwegian entrepreneur in the city of Tacoma, I feel like I should build a shrine to Thea. We're going to meander down the cemetery a little bit now, because I would like to introduce you to another new friend of mine, Mr. Angelo Fawcett. Fawcett, Turkey Fawcett, five dollar a day Fawcett, all names were given to me during my 38 years of politics. But the one I cherish the most is Fighting Fawcett. Many were given, many names were given to me that probably should not be repeated in the presence of ladies. It was the Tacoma Times said of me, It is a strong man who makes lasting friends and inveterate enemies. No man of weak character is able to oppose powerful interests and retain the respect of others around him. I think I've done a great deal in my life. Four times mayor of Tacoma, state senator, but more importantly, many valuable municipal projects 
for the people. Well, everyone's story starts someplace. I was born in Ohio, the eldest of four children. We soon end up moving to Illinois. There I ended up attending public schools and graduated from the Wesleyan University. Because of the war, I end up signing up with the Illinois 7th Infantry. Altoona Pass, Georgia, 1864. Our company came under attack by the Confederates. Of the 60 brave men that happened to be there, 16 survived. I was shot three times. Surgeon said, son, we're gonna have to take off your leg. And I said, no, you won't. I felt like my strong character would be able to do me well for the rest of my life. After I mustered out in the army, tried my hand at several different jobs, but the one that I seemed to be the most successful at was traveling salesman for a farm implement company. And one of the trips I ended up taking brought me to the Pacific Northwest. And I thought this would be a fine place to be able to live. So I packed up the family and we moved to Tacoma. Soon my brother ended up joining us and we established the Fawcett Brothers Farm Implement and Seed Company. In a few short years became one of the most successful businesses in Tacoma. Shortly thereafter, we added the Western Wagon Wheel Company, which became the largest of its kind on the West Coast. Living in Tacoma, politics caught my eye. Helped establish the new Democratic Party, which with that one, I was told that I should end up running for city commissioner for the third ward. And I was successful on the second try. Being a city commissioner, I end up realizing how much the crash of 1893 had impacted the people and poor of Tacoma. I've always said that money is good for one thing, is that to help people. And so, just before Christmas 1893, I hired Germani Hall. Gave away tickets for a free turkey dinner. Could I help it if the printer ended up putting my likeness on the tickets? On that day, we served over 2,000 dinners, pies, and every child walk away with an apple. Some would call this cheap politics, but I said it is important that we end up helping those that are less fortunate than us. Thus, I earned the name Turkey Fawcett. And I had friends end up finding people, families, that needed my help without letting others know about it. 1896, I ended up running for mayor, and I won by two votes. Of course, there was a recount. Some of the ballots were stolen. They put Mr. Orr back in the office of mayor until the state Supreme Court ended up saying, no, I was the rightful mayor. I walked on in, cleared house, and helped set the finances of Tacoma together. I strongly believe that it was important for the people to own the utilities. And during my time as mayor, I ended up helping push force the bond issues for the 11th Street Bridge and for a new municipal dock, first one of its kind in Washington State. And I said on its completion that this is the new industrial epoch for Tacoma. For now, Tacoma ends up having its own electric company and its new municipal dock. Tried to bring a little bit of culture end up to Tacoma. I donated a water fountain to the city. Fawcett's Fountain, they ended up calling it. And I end up declaring Shakespeare Week. To observe or not to observe, that is the question. And it was said by many of the newspapers that I ended up showing my characteristic lack of tact. But I, when I saw something that was important for the people of Tacoma, I would brick no opposition. In later years, I was recalled as mayor, won again mayor by a landslide. 
suggested to become governor of Washington State. And finally, fourth time mayor elected to mayor of Tacoma. And during all of those campaigns, win or lose, I was accused of everything from chicken stealing to highway robbery. But it was the people. The people saw me who fool who I was. Someone there with the big stick willing to swing it to make their lives just a little bit better. I believe I was put here on this earth to help the people, not for the moneyed interests. It was an early Sunday morning. After 81 tumultuous years, I passed away, much like I had been doing most of my life, fighting to the end. And now I set the challenge to each and every one of you to remember you are the guardians of the memories of those of us who have gone before. Thank you, Mr. Fawcett. Um, I think that's just the most beautiful example of Tacoma in a nutshell is that the movers and shakers, the people that we're meeting tonight are, are just the perfect core sample of Tacoma in my mind, where they are incredibly prominent, successful, hardworking people, but they don't achieve that sort of international stardom that was never their goal. Their goal was to build something true and honest and good. And they committed to it and become local heroes for it. And that's enough for them. It's it's absolutely beautiful stuff. Uh, I adore it with every fiber that I have. And I think it's incredibly brought to life by our reenactors tonight, which it seems like everyone else agrees with as well here. We also had a very good question. The Tacoma Cemetery, when did this show up on the map? And 1875 is the year listed as the first year that Tacoma Cemetery shows up. It's currently off of South Tacoma Way, right? As you're, you know, come around the curve and you're headed south down onto Maine, South Tacoma Way down there. Uh, I'll post plenty of link links about it here at the end, but we're gonna meander just across the lane really quick because it is now my privilege to introduce you to Mr. William Fife. I'm certainly not complaining, but uh, if I had died a few years earlier, I'd have probably had a lot larger tombstone. Fortunes rise and fall, that's just life. I was born the 1st of October, 1834 in Otonabee, Ontario, Canada. My parents were farmers, but I was never keen on working the land. So at the age of 16, I set out uh, from home to become an apprentice in a general merchandising business. I like to think I was a good learner. Four years and at the age of 20, I was ready to start a merchandising business of my own. That was also the year, 1854, that I won the hand of Harriet Johnson in marriage. And pretty soon we had a growing family to provide for. I was always looking for that next big opportunity. And there were times when all the world had to do was whisper, gold, and William Hutchinson Fife had come running, pick in hand. I spent three years in the mining business in uh, the caribou country in British Columbia. Never quite found El Dorado, but I did come away with enough to set us up in some larger enterprises in Michigan, then in Iowa. But I was still looking for that one big opportunity. In 1873, it came. I was here in Tacoma, on Commencement Bay, when it was announced that the Northern Pacific Railway had chosen Tacoma to be the western terminus of a northern tier transcontinental railroad. Now to me, that was the trumpet of destiny sounding. I raced back to Iowa, sold off our business enterprises, bundled up Harriet and our five children and two servants, and I came dashing back. We arrived back in Tacoma the 14th of April, 1874, to find the Blackwell Hotel and really not much else. Next day, I followed a dirt path up the hill to the office of the Tacoma Land Company. It's turned out to be a one-room shack and a patch of skunk cabbage around what's now 9th and Broadway. That was a small start, but I remained confident that growth would come, uh, dare I say, like a speeding locomotive. 
I uh, secured a piece of land, got a house built in a couple of days, uh, then set about building New Tacoma's first store. I was also New Tacoma's first postmaster, from serving from 1874 to 1882. In those days, uh, people were expected to pick up their mail at the post office, which just happened to be in the back of my store, past all the tempting merchandise. But that first day of service, my young son, William J. Fife, took it upon himself to ensuring that every last person in Tacoma who had a letter addressed to them got that letter delivered directly to their door. All five or six of them. Well, as I'd hoped and expected, Tacoma grew rapidly. Our, our store prospered. We opened others in other locations. I acquired a quarter interest in the Tacoma Coal Company. I, I helped build a floating dry dock in Quartermaster Harbor. I wore a lot of hats. Uh, various times I was the director of the Tacoma Opera Theater Company, the Tacoma Creamery, the Tacoma Exposition Company. I was a trustee of the Tacoma Chamber of Commerce, and uh, Harriet and I were trustees of the Tacoma uh, First Methodist Episcopal Church. By 1887, I was ready for the crowning project of my life. I invested $125,000 into building the Fife Hotel at 9th and Pacific Avenue. Used something like a million bricks to construct a hotel, five stories high, steam heated, with room for 250 guests at a time with space left over for offices, a restaurant, and other facilities. It opened in 1888, and within two years, we had gone through a dozen guest registry books in our lobby, according to the visit of over 75,000 paying guests. Now, the newspapers at the time said I was worth between one and two million dollars, and it was said by some that I was the largest taxpayer in uh, Tacoma and perhaps all of Pierce County. Now, my, my young son, uh, William J. Fife, was a fine actor. Uh, he was fascinated by all things theatrical, and uh, he may have influenced me in uh, the next project. Uh, all of my children did a lot to make the old man proud, but he was the only one that made the old man build a theater. We opened the Olympic Theater uh, on uh, Christmas Eve, 1892. That first evening, uh, 10 cents, uh, you could see uh, Bicycle stunts, comedy, a tender ballad, and Professor Horeman, the world's greatest magician and illusionist. In the larger part of the theater, the 900-seat auditorium, 35 cents to a dollar bought access to the play Michael Strogoff, based on a Jules Verne novel. Now we all know that uh, there's no guarantee that anything will last. As a number of my uh, residents here uh, have, uh, have observed, the great uh, financial panic of 1893 hit a lot of us cruelly hard. My fortune largely evaporated. The Hotel Fife became the Hotel Donnelly. Harriet and I moved out of the Grand Suite and into a nearby boarding house. The theater tottered along uh, for a few years under a variety of names, uh, managed for a while by my son William J. before it too went under like so much else. Uh, but I do still believe we had picked a good spot for uh, a theater. It was on uh, 9th Avenue between uh, Broadway and Market Street. Uh, the Rialto Theater sits there now. Well, there was no use being morose or bitter. I just went on looking for that next big opportunity. 1898, I joined the rush to the Klondike. I got as far as uh, Skagway, turned back uh, with nothing but memories like almost everyone else. Well, for richer, for poorer, 1904, Harriet and I celebrated our golden wedding anniversary. And uh, late December of that year, I headed off to the promising name of Goldfield, Nevada. I had uh, high hopes of a rich strike, but instead the trumpet of destiny had started to play taps for old Bill Fife. I was 70, and I probably shouldn't have gone traipsing off after El Dorado yet again, especially in the dead of winter. I took sick down there and uh, made my way back to the home of our daughter in Alameda, California. In came January 16, 1905. Death certificate said pneumonia. Avoid it if you can. That was the end for me, but uh, family had my body brought back here to Tacoma. It's good to be home. It's good to be in the place where I helped a young city grow and prosper. Now it's your turn to 
help move things along, you'll have successes and reverses as well. Be plucky. And remember, you're the guardians of the memories of those who have gone before. And I do believe that uh, no one is truly and completely gone as long as someone remembers them. This is an excellent opportunity to take one moment and acknowledge the tremendous amount of work and research that goes into this production. Each of these reenactors, these historians, is deeply vested in the community here in Tacoma. And obviously, as you've seen for yourself, have done a tremendous amount of work. And uh, because we get to do this this year, I do want to just take a moment and say that if you are enjoying yourselves tonight and you want to share some financial appreciation, you can always do so on the homepage of Pretty Gritty Tours. I will make sure that this gets dispersed amongst the group tonight because I think everyone put a lot of really tremendous effort into this. So we are going to waltz across the way right now. I'm going to take you briefly through the cemetery, and then we are going to meet our next guest tonight, Mr. Chester Thorne. Ladies and gentlemen, I assume that most of you are interested in Tacoma's history, so you've probably heard of my house over on American Lake. Folks call it uh, Thornwood Castle. See, I was always fascinated by the old English style estates, and uh, I spent some time in the British Isles gathering up the materials to build my house. Had it all shipped around the Horn on three ships. Construction started in 1908 and was completed in 1911 at a cost of over a million dollars. The Thornwood was built on a 100-acre estate with 30 acres of gardens. There were 40 rooms in its 31,000 square feet. Presidents Theodore Roosevelt and William Howard Taft have stayed within its walls. It still stands in Lakewood today and is still a thing of beauty. But enough about my house. I suppose you came here to learn a little bit about me. Where to begin? The beginning. I was born in New York on uh, November 11th, 1863. In 1884, I graduated from Yale with a degree in uh, engineering and went to work for the Missouri and Pacific Railroad, where I met and became friends with H.M. Hoxie, the general manager. In 1886, I married Mr. Hoxie's niece, Anna, and in 1890, Anna and I moved to Tacoma, where I invested in the National Bank of Commerce. I was later named president of the National Bank of Commerce at the age of 29 in 1893 while traveling in Europe just in time for the panic of 93. But the National Bank of Commerce pr prospered in uh, the panic of 93 partially because of my financial prowess and partially because of large infusions of my own fortune, saving the stockholders and depositors a devastating loss. In 1913, National Bank of Commerce consolidated with Pacific National Bank and created the National Bank of Tacoma, to which I was named Chairman of the Board. After my passing, Anna took over on the Board of Directors and continued to oversee my philanthropy. During the Great War, I was on the Executive Committee of the Tacoma Chapter of the Red Cross. I also served as Chairman of the Finance Committee. My daughter, Anita, also served as joint chair of the Surgical Dressing Works. Our, our chapter started in 1916 with 36 members, and by the end of the year, we had over 8,000 members. Tacoma's waterfront was populated by a gaggle of privately owned docks and stevedoring companies, mostly owned by the railroads. They had little or no sense of direction and no eye to the future, but a lot of us knew there had to be a better way. So I helped found the Port of Tacoma. By a vote of the people, on November 5th, 1918, by a five to one margin, the Port of Tacoma was born. Edward Kloss, a longshore official, C.W. Orton, a farmer, and I were elected as port commissioners. I was elected to be the port commissioner where I served for seven years until failing health caused me to have to step down. 
Our first duty as port commissioners was to visit the Port of Seattle and find out what they were doing that worked and what wasn't working. Now, I do believe that adding Mr. Orton, because of his ability to show the farmers how the port could facilitate getting their crops shipped in a timely manner, was key to getting the votes we needed to realize our dream. We received our first ship, the Edmore, in 1921, and since the Edmore's arrival, the Port of Tacoma has become a powerhouse on the West Coast. I was a staunch advocate of the founding of Mount Rainier National Park and helped lead the way to opening the park to the public. I was president of Rainier Park Corp Company and helped in the development of Paradise Lodge and other concessions. I also fought hard alongside Ashel Denman, another guest here at the cemetery, albeit in vain to change the name of the mountain back to Mount Tahoma, as it should be. My name comes up on the board of directors of many businesses and charitable organizations in and around Tacoma, not the least of which are Tacoma General Hospital and uh, Annie Wright Seminary. Two other prominent guests here in the cemetery, Bishop Paddock and Bishop Wells, were figured prominently in the founding of the Annie Wright Seminary, and Bishop Paddock obviously was the guiding light behind Tacoma General Hospital, having built it for his wife, Fanny. Another business that I was involved with here in the City of Destiny, I was on the executive committee along with Messrs. Ash, Ashton, Rust, and Gregory, and of course Mr. Weaver was H.C. Weaver Productions, a movie studio based right here in Tacoma. Now we on the executive committee knew that the notoriety that movie making would bring to Tacoma was priceless. The studio building built on donated land at Titlow Beach with donated lumber was the second largest studio building in the country. We made three silent movies, Hearts and Fists, Eyes of the Totem, and uh, Heart of the Yukon, I believe it was. Now, Eyes of the Totem was my favorite, partially because of my involvement with the Tacoma Totem Pole and Thornwood, uh, Paradise Lodge, and Annie Wright were also featured in the movie. Now, on uh, October 6th, 1927, Warner Brothers released The Jazz Singer, and talkies were born. Now, a lot of our distribution deals didn't turn out as Mr. Wright had predicted, and the cost of going to a sound studio was prohibitive. Also, on October 16th of 1927, I passed away. And it seems that with me, H.C. Wright Stud or H.C. Wright Productions also passed. Mr. Mr. Wright disappeared. The studio building was converted into a dance hall and later burned down by an arsonist. You know, and in retrospect, I do believe that Mr. Weaver was a bit of a flim-flam man. Now, personal financial gain was never my first consideration in my enterprises, but what would it do for the community? So when asked to invest in an enterprise, my first question would be, how will this benefit Tacoma? Although I wasn't afraid to spend my money on business or on charity or on toys. Uh, W.F. Sheard and myself uh, financed the Tacoma Totem Pole in Fireman's Park. I once owned a yacht named El Primero. She was 120 feet long, 18 feet of beam, had a range of 3,000 miles. I bought her because she reminded me of a seagoing version of Thornwood. President Taft in 1907 and again in 1909 was a passenger on board El Primero. Now, I firmly believe that one must invest boldly to profit greatly. Bearing that in mind, I lost El Primero to newspaper man Sam uh, Perkins in a poker game. But they do say nothing ventured, nothing gained. I have been described as kindly, gentle, unostentatious, and unselfish. Such aspirations as I had were in behalf of the general welfare and not for myself. In the highest sense, I treated wealth or the responsibility of wealth as a trust committed to me for the benefit of my fellow man. Such wonderfully kind words. And now, as you go on your way this evening, remember that you are the keepers or the guardians of, the, of those of us who have gone before. I gotta say, 
Flim Flam Man is something that I need to integrate into my daily vocabulary significantly more. Uh, we are now going to reel it way back to the very early history of Tacoma with our final uh, guest of the cemetery tonight. It is my privilege and honor to introduce you to Miss, Mrs. Julia McCarver. My appearance. I'm usually dressed better than this, but have you ever found it's difficult to keep things clean, especially when you're traveling and moving around so much? I have moved and rebuilt my family's home 10 times across six states in my lifetime. And this is where I'm staying. And I'm determined to keep this one clean. Oh, but I haven't introduced myself. My name is Julia Ann McCoy Buckaloo McCarver. I was born Julia Ann McCoy and grew up in St. Charles County, Missouri. My parents died when I was young, so I lived with my grandparents until I married Mr. Garrett Buckaloo and we moved to Illinois to build a new life. We lived there for six years before Oregon fever struck. 16 families from our area, including Mr. Buckaloo, myself, and our two children, decided to head west to build a new destiny in the Willamette Valley in Oregon. I lost a child in the plains, and when, as we reached the Barlow Road in Oregon, my husband caught a severe cold and died a few days later. My daughter and I continued on to the Willamette Valley in Oregon. There I met General Morton McCarver. He and I were married and combined our families. Strangely enough, it was General McCarver's letters to an Eastern paper that sparked Mr. Buckaloo's interest in traveling to Oregon. General McCarver and I lived on his farm near Oregon City with our children. It was a noted place and as we built it up, it became even more so. However, mid-1848, there were the reports of the discovery of gold in California. Well, dear husband was one of the first to head off for the gold fields. He did so well that in May 1849, he sent for me to join him. With the children in boarding schools, I set sail by ship for San Francisco. We stayed in the only hotel in town, paying $21 a week for the dubious privilege of sleeping under the dining room table. But husband had already purchased lumber to build us a house in Sacramento and the work soon began. I did not find California to my liking. When I could stand it no longer, I shared my feelings with my husband and he agreed I should return to Oregon. What a trip. The bark I was on became disabled, so we had to sail to Fort Victoria up north. From there it was by canoe and horseback that I traveled back to Oregon City. I was the only woman on the trip and the men tried to convince me to ride astride the horse as the Indian women did. Can you imagine? I had my own way in the matter. About the same time I reached Oregon City, Sacramento had one of the, the largest flood in its history or since. Our home there was washed away and completely lost. Husband soon returned home to our farm and we greeted the arrival of several more daughters. Life on the farm was alternately dull and exciting. Husband was away much of the time, hard to still those wandering feet. We moved several more times and in 1868, he obtained a small claim on the south shore of Commencement Bay on Puget Sound. My daughters and I traveled up from Portland by steamboat, canoe and wagon. The last couple of miles to the claim were delightfully refreshing as we traveled via canoe with the light summer breeze and the sea-laden air. A lovely change from the dusty wagon ride. The small wooden shack we stayed in, built by Anthony Carr, was less than delightful. But husband again had already purchased lumber to build us a home. It was a pleasant summer full of many diversions and careful selection of where to build the new home. My daughters and I returned to Portland in October, coming back five months later on the first steamer to ruffle the waters of Commencement Bay in front of the town. I made sure we arrived with the things needed for the new house, including doors, windows, paint, and doorknobs. Our house was the first one made of milled lumber and needed the proper accompaniments worthy of my family. We were one of the first families to establish a permanent home here. 
Life was hard, but no harder than other places I'd lived. General McCarver was highly regarded by the Indians. In fact, they were awestruck by him as they had somehow found out that he could remove his teeth and put them back in his mouth, a feat they had never seen nor heard of. It was quite primitive around our home. The girls and I did not investigate what kinds of animals lived in the dense woods, but were well aware of the skunks that took it upon themselves to visit us. They got in the woodshed, on the porches, prowled the yard, and would have come in the house if we left the doors open. After looking around the area, husband recommended this place as a site for a cemetery and was the first adult buried here. Sadly, he did not live to see the future he'd envisioned for this Tacoma, but my girls and I carried on to build that future. Our home was noted as the finest and best in town. In later years, after my daughters married Mr. Thomas Proch, Mr. Clinton Ferry, and Mr. William Harris, I traveled to visit my grandchildren by rail and by steamer. I wondered at the world around me changing so rapidly, providing civilization and comfort such as I'd never thought to see. But my time is now over. It is now your time to build your destiny. Remember, you are the guardians of the memories of those of us who have come before. Well, welcome back. I do want to address something here brought up, uh, and it's, it's blown up the chat right now. But yes, there has been some discussion uh, as to the difference in their headstones. And I do think it's worth acknowledging that uh, Mr. Morton Matthew McCarver has this as his actual headstone, his marker, uh, equally modest, although it doesn't say father, whereas uh, the other one does say mother. But the, the large grandiose stone that you saw there was actually brought in significantly later in the game uh, over a hundred years later by the daughters of the American revolution who are coming through and beautifying certain areas. So don't panic too much. That was not a decision made by general McCarver. That is something that was done, um, later, significantly later in the game. Again, his doesn't say mother, so you can make your own, you know, <laughs> thoughts and quips about that. But uh, it's also, he wasn't like, I'm gonna build a skyscraper. <laughs> I'm sorry, you get this. So there you go. Now, uh, let's take a moment really quick. Uh, Melissa is coming back with a few words. Well, I hope you enjoyed your tour and learning a little bit more about some of Tacoma's early residents. But before we close, I would like to take just a minute and uh, share a couple of extra tidbits about a few of the people you've just met. First of all, we have Angelo Fawcett. Angelo Fawcett was truly as gener generous as he was colorful. Even during financial hard times, he never foreclosed on any of the farmers who'd purchased seed and equipment from him. He simply wrote off the losses. It's estimated he forgave about one and a half million dollars in debt. He also always carried a large blue pencil and a checkbook to give money to those who needed it. Now, as you may recall, Mayor Fawcett talked about donating a water fountain to the city. This large, ornate fountain still stands on Pacific Avenue near Fireman's Park. At the time it was installed, it was affectionately known as Fawcett's Fawcett. Then we have Chester Thorne. Thornwood Castle, the home of Chester Thorne, described still stands. It's been restored to its former grandeur and serves as a rental facility today. It has also been used as a set for several movies, including serving as the haunted mansion for the television miniseries Rose Red by Stephen King. Thorne's funeral book is in the collection of the Tacoma Historical Society. Thorne's generosity in terms of time and money is well documented within his pages. And Thea Foss. After Thea's death, her husband Andrew was asked, what was the best business decision he ever made? His reply was, marrying Thea. And the Foss Boathouse motto was taken from a family joking about how the coffee pot Thea kept full and hot on the stove was always ready. The business she started by renting and selling rowboats is no longer owned by the family but, and is now called Foss Maritime, but they still use the same motto, always ready. And then we have Herbert Hunt. Hunt's three book series, Tacoma, its history and its builders, half a century of activity, is a series of conversational tales told by a master storyteller. 
The books have been reprinted by the Tacoma Historical Society with a much appreciated index not included with the original. And Hunt himself was a popular after-dinner speaker at social events here in Tacoma. On topics from current events to gardening, he was the president of the Rose Society, and to history. It was said he knew more about the Civil War than anyone else in Pierce County. He hoped to write a history of the Civil War for young readers, but unfortunately died before it could be accomplished. Now, you may recall that Hunt mentioned that someday people would regret hanging Leshi. Well, in 2004, in a historical court of inquiry headed by a Washington State Supreme Court justice, they found Leshi to be innocent of all the charges leveled against him. And finally, the Tacoma Cemetery itself. This tour was presented at the Tacoma Cemetery, Tacoma's first. These 42 acres of land were donated by the Tacoma Land Company to the town of New Tacoma for cemetery purposes in 1874. The city in turn deeded the land to the Board of Trustees of Tacoma Cemetery in 1884. The first person to be buried in the cemetery was Julia McCarver's husband, Morton McCarver. He was buried here in 1875. And in closing, we once again would like to th thank the cemetery for hosting the tour and actors for researching, writing, and presenting their personalities with such skill. And two pretty gritty tours for making the virtual tour possible. But there is one other special thank you, and that's to Herbert Hunt himself. Herbert Hunt's books continue to serve as a tremendous resource for everyone researching early Tacoma history and continue to bring it to light. But now remember, you are the caretakers of the memories of those who have gone before. With that, ladies and gentlemen, thank you once again for joining us tonight. Thank you so much to the Tacoma Cemetery for letting me uh, clomp around there and film everything. And an infinite amount of thank yous to the truly phenomenal, accomplished, hardworking team of reenactors and historians that have kept this history alive. They are truly the guardians of the history of those who have gone before. They are preserving that front line every day and uh, allowing me to be a part of this has been really tremendous. So if you have enjoyed your tour tonight and you would like to tip your guide uh, or any of the reenactors, you can always put that in, in the information bar there and I'll make sure that they get it because uh, they've put so much incredible work into this. Thank you all for coming out and celebrating some of Tacoma's story. I think Tacoma is a phenomenal city that has somewhat of a bad reputation and people get really stuck on that. So taking these moments to celebrate and revel in the things that have been done here mean a lot to me. Thank you guys for joining me on a Friday night. I look forward to our next virtual encounter and hey, we're back in business. So if you ever want to go out and see the great city of destiny or the greater Pierce County area, let us know prettygrittytours.com. Until then, my friends, you are now the guardians of the history of those who have come before. Have a good night. Keep on exploring.